Atlanta service agencies are looking for volunteers to send out across the city and count how many people are experiencing homelessness. The annual point in time count starts with a nighttime census of people living on the streets January 23rd. Day shift starts on the 24th. Volunteers will also be expected to try and connect the unsheltered population with resources like information on shelters, soup kitchens, and churches during food drives. The surveys provide demographic information and give policymakers a sense of who needs services and where they're needed most. Volunteers will report to St. Luke's Episcopal Church on the evening of January 23rd. First count will take place from 7 p.m. to about 3 a.m. Lawmakers are back for their 40-day session, and so is our Gold Dome Scramble, the pop-up podcast from Political Breakfast that's all about the legislature. I'm Sam Greenglass, and each week we will discuss the hot topics from the state capitol and how they could affect you. Gold Dome Scramble from Political Breakfast drops every Friday afternoon. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The government is calling it the biggest settlement ever for mortgage discrimination. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks delivers what's next in cybersecurity innovation to protect today's digital way of life. Learn more at paloaltonetworks.com. I'm David Brancaccio. The Department of Justice says City National Bank will pay $31 million to address discrimination in its lending. The government says City National avoided lending in communities of color in the Los Angeles area, where the bank is based. Marketplace's Nancy Marshall Genzer is following this settlement. Yeah, David, Nancy. City National is accused of uh, City National is accused of redlining, David, and that is not providing credit to people in mostly black and Hispanic neighborhoods. DOG, DOJ says the bank did this from 2017 through at least 2020 only opening one branch in those neighborhoods, not staffing it with anyone dedicated to making mortgage loans. And the Justice Department complaint also says during this time, other banks got more than six times as many loan applications in black and Hispanic neighborhoods in the LA area. So the city pays a fine. What about its future behavior? DOJ says City National has agreed to invest more than $29 million in a loan subsidy fund for residents of majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in L.A. County, plus open a new branch in one of those neighborhoods, and it has to do a study of the need for financial services in those neighborhoods. And City National is part of the Royal Bank of Canada, and it's noted for its many banking relationships with Hollywood figures. What's the bank's view in this case? The bank says it disagrees with the Justice Department's allegations, but supports the DOJ's efforts to, quote, ensure equal access to credit for all consumers, regardless of race. Nancy, thank you. And all this rain in California is helping with the drought there, but there's a lot of work to do. The level of the state's second largest reservoir, Oroville, is now 13% higher than it was going into Christmas, but it's still 15% below full. And the U.S. Drought Monitor says most of California remains in a state of extreme or severe drought. There are now calls to rethink how water gets stored there. Here's Marketplace's Lily Jamali. The reality of climate change is now on display here, not just during peak fire season, but year-round. The recent storms are the latest example of what scientists are calling weather whiplash. Climate expert Dustin Mulvaney teaches at San Jose State University. We need to be preparing for the next flood during the drought, and we need to be preparing for the next drought during this big rainy sequence, because we'll forget otherwise. Here in Southern California, the LA River is looking like an actual river, concrete banks notwithstanding, and not a trickle, as it so often does. But this region's waterways are designed to take much of the rainwater out to sea to limit flooding. Various efforts to redesign those systems to conserve water are already underway. Matt Horton of the Milken Institute says doing so throughout the state is critical. What we really need is, you know, a 21st century water project that brings all this together in a more vital, accelerated time. Horton says more predictable and long-term sources of funding are essential. As it stands now, 
Government officials say building the infrastructure to fully capture stormwater in California will take decades. In Los Angeles, I'm Lily Jamali for Marketplace. Markets Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ futures are all down in the 8 tenths of 1% rate. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by the United States Postal Service, offering postage stamps for purchase at more than 40,000 supermarkets, drugstores, office suppliers, and wholesale clubs. And by JLL, a commercial real estate leader using data and technology to solve today's complex real estate challenges. Learn more at JLL.com. JLL, see a brighter way. The International Monetary Fund says millions of people in low-income countries face extreme hunger as interest rates go up, making it hard for the countries to pay down their international loans. One country which has already defaulted is Sri Lanka, but there's also a political crisis. The BBC's Ben Chu filed this from Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo. Six months ago in Sri Lanka, amid sovereign debt default and economic chaos, there was a revolution. A new president has since been installed. An international monetary fund bailout has been agreed. But half a year on, are the lives of ordinary Sri Lankans actually any better? Is a new day dawning for the country's agricultural sector, on which a quarter of the population depends? Sri Lankan tea pickers earn a day rate of around a thousand rupees, a little less than three US dollars. And though inflation in the country has eased slightly since last year, food prices in Sri Lanka last month were still 65% higher than a year earlier. Rice, sugar and everything else is expensive. Even bus fares are expensive. Everything is a problem now. I can't say we have enough food. I'm afraid for my child's future. More than 8 million people, more than a third of Sri Lanka's population, are today estimated to be food insecure by the United Nations. The fuel queues that snaked around this country six months ago have gone thanks to a digital rationing system. Tourists are returning. A different world from the capital, Colombo, can be found a two-hour drive south down the coast. A million people in Sri Lanka are estimated to be reliant on fishing for their living. The cost of boat fuel for these fisher folk in Berawala is still four times higher than before the crisis struck last year, making each trip into an economic gamble. Places like this feel like the sharp end of Sri Lanka's economic crisis at the moment. It's clear that in some parts of the country life has got somewhat better in recent months but in places like this it's really just as painful as it was before the fall of the government. Ben Chu reporting there for our partners at the BBC and Apple's CEO won't have to bring peanut butter sandwiches from home to scrimp but there is news Tim Cook is taking a 40 percent pay cut for this year and a government filing Apple lists Cook's 2023 compensation target now is 49 million dollars. Apple indicates this came after shareholder feedback sustained complaints about his pay and Cook's own recommendation about this. It's also true that Apple made just under $100 billion in profit in its 2022 accounting year, the most net income ever. I'm David Brancaccio, the Marketplace Morning Report. From ABC News, American Public Media. I'm Ron Hartzell in downtown Atlanta. WABE is online on your smart speaker, on TV, and on the radio. W-A-B-E, Atlanta. It was a year of raised hopes and devastating tragedy, and the world of jazz continued to reflect both the growing unease and the youthful vitality of a nation in transition. I'm David Brent Johnson, inviting you to join me for the music of John Coltrane, Jackie McLean, Eric Dolphy, and others on 1963, A Man's Dream, A Nation's Nightmare. This week on Nightlights, Monday morning at 11 on 90.1 WABE. Today, a story from a civil rights leader who died during the pandemic. At StoryCorps, he spoke to his daughter about the first time he took a stand over wages in a cotton field in Louisiana. It's Friday, January 13th. Happy birthday to Julia Louis-Dreyfus. She's 62 years old today.
News is next. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. Attorney General Merrick Garland is appointing a special counsel to investigate the discovery of classified documents at President Biden's Delaware home and another location. NPR's Claudia Grisales reports House Republicans are seeking to conduct their own investigation. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told reporters that Congress should investigate the discoveries of White House documents tied to President Biden's time as vice president under the Obama administration. Not once, but now we're finding in two different locations classified information just out there in the open. But McCarthy stopped short of saying which Republican-led panel should lead the probe. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer has already said his panel was investigating and will hold a related hearing. However, Comer said Attorney General Merrick Garland's appointment of a special counsel could limit his committee's ability to conduct a separate probe. Claudia Grisales, NPR News, Washington. Seven people have been killed in a gigantic storm system that barreled across the South yesterday. The National Weather Service says more than 30 tornadoes were reported from Kentucky to Mississippi. Most of them hit Alabama. Owen Anderson works at a car wash in Moulton, north of Birmingham, Alabama. He ducked inside the building for safety. Me and my attendant got my, my buddy working here with me. We ran and ran in the center of the tunnel, lifted it up, and hopped in the pit where all the mud stuff goes in the car. That's the safest place to be. Meanwhile, the National Weather Service says more storms are poised to strike the West Coast today, lasting through the weekend. Storms since Christmas have left at least 17 people dead in California. Flood watches are posted for northern and central California. Russia claims that its forces and mercenaries have captured the eastern Ukrainian town of Solodar. The Ukrainian government rejects this claim. NPR's Tim Mack reports from Kyiv, brutal fighting continues in the Ukrainian town. Before the war, Solodar had a population of around 80,000 and was known for its salt mines. Now. It has become the focus of brutal Russian and Ukrainian urban warfare. President Volodymyr Zelensky said in his overnight address that the fighting in Solodar and Bakhmut is the top issue for his military staff. He said he discussed with them what reinforcements might be necessary, as well as future military operations. Russian and Ukrainian sources have traded conflicting claims. The Russian military said Friday that Solodar is firmly under their control. But the Ukrainian military said these...